hello. Uh, after PPP, uh, we are BBB, Bye Bye Venery Collective. Um, so you, we are here uh, today to present a bit uh, about the collective uh, that uh, work around uh, new graphic and typographic shapes uh, around uh, non-binary and trans and uh, LGBT questions. Um, so today uh, I'm Eugenie and this is Marielle. Uh, we are two here, but uh, actually the collective is much bigger. So you can see uh, all the members' uh, names on the screen. Um, we, we give um, workshops, so our, our main focus is on type and uh, typography, but uh, there are also a lot of uh, people who do uh, like artistic performances, uh, like calligraphy, um, graphic design in a very broad sense, so we have uh, many other practices also. Uh, these are just some pictures of um, a few workshops that we gave uh, during uh, the last uh, four years. Um. And yeah, basically what we do most is draw letters. So it happens on uh, screens, but it also happens with paints sometimes. <laughs> um. uh, so at some point, um, the collective um, ask uh, what uh, oh sorry <laughs> um, we create like post binary typography and uh, <coughs> to that we have to ask ourselves uh, what's wrong with French <laughs> and what's wrong with French it's a very gendered language uh, that uh, has uh, two separated very separated forms for uh, masculine and feminine when English <coughs> can include in some words the feminine and the masculine forms. Um, so yeah, it's a very binary grammar. Um, so also uh, when there are plurals, uh, the masculine uh, prevails. So it's a, a, a rule that uh, we learn in school. Um, so it's uh, completely mask the feminine when they are in the inner group. Yeah, and this uh, rule of uh, masculine that prevails is actually historically situated and not neutral uh, at all. But I won't get into uh, linguistic history right here. But uh, yeah, some uh, feminist uh, activists uh, in um, starting. Um, in the second part of the 20th century, started uh, using other forms of writing in order to make uh, uh, the feminine uh, more visible in language. Uh, so that's what uh, is now called uh, écriture inclusive, inclusive writing, we would translate it like that. And uh, it uses uh, what you see on the bottom, uh, a sign that uh, made a lot of uh, press in France, uh, which is the middle dot. And, uh, but uh, yeah, so that's the table we saw before. So basically the middle dot separates the masculine form from uh, the feminine one. And you have the feminine ending, which is uh, added uh, to, uh, to the world. Um, this uh, this is uh, much better than uh, nothing than using uh, the masculine for everyone, um, but it's it still has problems. It's still very binary, and you have the feminine on one side and the masculine on the other, and they are clearly separated uh, with uh, this uh, this dot, which actually was used in ancient Greek. Uh, it's the ancestor of the space, so it's. Uh, Divining, dividing sign. Um, so that's not really politically the way we think uh, about uh, gender in uh, our very queer community. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why, as graphic and type designers, we started um, 
experimenting with uh, different ways of uh, yeah using uh, characters and glyphs uh, to propose something different and maybe a bit uh, less binary. So yeah, you have some example here uh, that uh, came after the middle dot and are inspired by this, but uh, this uh, proposition is more like uh, trying to link the feminine and the masculine form. Um, and it was the beginning of uh, playing with the letters and uh, linking the feminine and the masculine form uh, through typography, type design. Um, so uh, Baskerval here, uh, which is uh, after the step we we previously uh, saw. Um, um, yeah, because first we on this slide you can see that uh, we started playing around with the idea of the middle dot, but making it more of a link or including it in the letters, but. Um, we pretty quickly dropped it completely and uh, started experimenting with ligatures, which uh, have been around for um, uh, almost as long as the Latin alphabet, but uh, didn't have uh, this particular meaning. But we thought it would be interesting for this uh, this use, yeah. um, and that's uh, yeah what stayed basically with us. So we we are drawing mainly ligatures. Um, for post-binary purposes, um, to, to, to we've uh, we've been uh, uh, we've had some commissions from a cultural institution uh, since uh, uh, I mean it started in 2021. I think the first one. Um, a lot of theatres in Brussels. Um, it's easier to to have uh, this kind of um, experimentations in uh, in Belgium than in France. Uh, it's a bit less uh, reactionary climate uh, <laughs> regarding language. Um, so yeah, a lot of uh, theatres in Brussels, and you can see that uh, these ligatures were always uh, kind of doing the the same uh, thing but with different shapes that also have s different political uh, um, strategies uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah so still uh, theaters in brussels a festival in brussels and we adapt also to the shape of the font because all of these are forks of existing open source typefaces. That's something we practice a lot. Um, but yeah, this is uh, the School of Architecture of Saint-Étienne, so it does happen in France uh, sometimes. Um, so yeah, that was uh, basically how it uh, it looks, uh, what uh, political ideas are behind it. Now we're going to talk uh, very briefly about how it works technically. Uh, <laughs> so in order to make uh, all the fonts technically compatible between them, uh, we created uh, what we call the CUNY, uh, the Queer Unicode <laughs> Initiative, um, because well, Unicode, um, I don't think I have to explain to this audience too much what is the Unicode, but when you're making fonts, it's something you cannot really escape. Uh, so each character in uh, every writing system in the world has, uh, uh, well, not all writing systems in the world yet, but they, they want to. Um, each character has its own uh, little box with its own little uh, hexadecimal uh, code. And, um, and for our post-binary characters, obviously they, they are not in Udin code, at least not yet. <laughs> so what we did was use what is called the private use area in the Unicode. So the private use ar area is composed of uh, boxes with uh, all these uh, codes uh, attached to them uh, that are completely empty. So you can put uh, whatever you want in them. Uh, so we proceeded to make uh, the most uh, exhaustive uh, list uh, possible of uh, post-binary characters that uh, 
some members of the collective and some also other people had a drone. And um, yeah, the idea was also to make a system where it's easy to implement new ones because we couldn't be completely exhaustive. It was uh, something uh, like uh, it's in process, basically. Um, and uh, and yeah, so every uh, every post-binary glyph has uh, its little icon, and we made this table that you can uh, see online. And uh, and yeah, you can scroll through it. And when uh, so the idea is that when a type designer is making a post-binary post font, they can encode uh, uh, all the post-binary fonts will be encoded. Uh, the same way, so you can uh, go from one to the other uh, without uh, the glyphs uh, just exploding uh, because yeah. <laughs> uh, because that's what happened before we did the CUNY. Um, and uh, and it's also accompanied by uh, open type uh, features. So thanks to the talk uh, of yesterday, you know everything about open type features now. So <laughs> but uh, if you don't remember, basically open type features are little uh, scripts that are included in the font file uh, and that can uh, modify the behavior of the font. Uh, when you type, so the idea here is uh, when uh, when you type, uh, yeah, I will show with a little video. Uh, when you type with using the middle dot, as this is the way uh, this is becoming kind of mainstream in uh, inclusive writing in French, uh, the, the inclusive uh, characters are called and the substitution happens automatically. So this is kind of an ideal uh, technology for this, uh, this use, even though it wasn't uh, really uh, designed for that uh, first, but uh, it works well. It works uh, almost in every software. Um, and it's uh, yeah in the front file, so you don't have to make uh, parameters, it's uh, automatic. And, and since um, middle dots can be hard to type on some keyboards, we also included uh, this uh, little line, which transforms uh, if you type two periods, uh, one after the other, they change automatically into a middle dot. And if you type three periods, it goes back to uh, the ellipsis, uh, which is its own uh, character. So there's no conflict normally. <laughs> So uh, we will talk about uh, yeah some example of fonts that uh, are uh, distributed on the uh, type the on typotech not not a foundry but like uh, yeah you you can download it uh, on the bye bye binary type typotech. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it will be soon uh, out that uh, there is a new version on the way. <laughs> ah, pardon. <laughs> pardon. <laughs> Thank you. Ouais. So, yeah, we will talk about the CUT, condition d'utilisation typographique engageante. Uh, condition for engaging typographic use in English. Uh, so yeah, we uh, we wrote this text um, during several uh, meetings in Brussels, um, and the aims of the text. Uh, oh, I will just read that. Um, the cute written by the Bye Bye Binary Collective are a way of bringing together people who design, distribute, and use post-binary fonts. These conditions are a kind of contract, a user guide, usable by anyone wishing to publish a post-binary font. Like a license, like a muscle on this rock, this text travels and spreads with the font file as they are downloaded. 
Uh, they stand out from most of free lessons by integrating the question of economics and the material condition of existence of designers. The critical and political ideas that drive them thus pollin pollinate a graphic practices committed to a radically feminist, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, queer and trans perspective. So that may be a lot to <laughs> digest this paragraph, but it's a uh, it's nice introduction to why we wrote uh, this text. Um, well, because uh, at first we used uh, like uh, every type designer who wishes to publish um, typefaces with uh, a f a uh, libre uh, and open source uh, license. We just chose the OFL. It's basically the, the default. Uh, but the OFL uh, had some problems because uh, it didn't um, it didn't take into consideration uh, economic uh, matters. It also viewed like authorship uh, in a very traditional and uh, questionable way. And um, and so first there was a, a work done uh, by uh, Clara Sambo, uh, who is part of the collective, who rewrote the OFL in a, in, in gender inclusive way, uh, but didn't change really uh, the content. Uh, so that was the first step, but that wasn't enough. Um, so that's why we started uh, thinking about the cute. Well, we didn't have the, the name then, but uh, we started meeting and uh, reading. Uh, we were um, actually influenced a lot by uh, something you may know, which is the CC4R, uh, which is a, a kind of license um, written by uh, Constant, which is a um, uh, a collective from Brussels. Um, so, what's in the cute? <laughs> so, uh, condition for use, copying, and sharing. Um, the first, we uh, f um, a main point for us was to link to make link between uh, the first contribution of a designer and the fork that can be done with uh, he or her work, their work. Um, so yeah, to credit and allocate and share complete files was a big uh, issue for, for us, a big subject, and uh, finding your place on the donation scale that we will talk after. Um, Condition for red redistribution, um, it's important for us to like keep cute um, and uh, keep the, the uh, yeah, the, this license, even if it's, uh, it can be compatible with like CC4R, gender fail, ACAB or non-violent li license, but you can like combine and uh, since it's not like a, a proper license, uh, only like um, yeah, it's just condition, so you can add some license to it. Um, and uh, cute in read the culture of free labor and open source, uh, but it's not te technically uh, compatible with any floss license. And uh, yes. Um. Yeah, it's not compatible uh, with uh, like OFL. The problem w was that it was uh, a bit too permissive, so we kind of uh, restricted a bit. But uh, keeping, uh, I mean, like the philosophy, <laughs> trying to maybe learn about uh, the ways maybe it didn't uh, take into account. Uh, of the oppressive uh, systems that uh, operate in society and uh, and kind of uh, ignore their existence in a way and we wanted to address that with the cute um, so and as for yeah the, um, the credit uh, part also i wanted to add uh, 
but in the OFL, you have to... Ah non, non, non sens c'est un peu plus tard. Ah oui, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so, conditions for modification. Uh, because we still wanted to the typefaces to be open source and to encourage uh, people to fork them. Um, but the conditions are, maybe it seems uh, obvious, but we had to kind of write it down. Do not delete the post-binary characters <laughs> to just make a normal font. <laughs> it would kind of defeat the purpose. And uh, also do not delete the open type features that activate them. Uh, and yeah, the idea is to also to keep affiliation, to rename but link. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, in OFL, you have uh, something that's called uh, the reserved font name, and uh, each font has one, uh, in in each font uh, published under the OFL license, that is. Um, and if you fork the font, it, you actually have to give a completely different name from uh, the one that the original uh, had. Um, and we understand why they did that. It's a question of uh, maintenance and if, uh, if there is a problem with the font uh, that uh, the user do not contact the original creator for something that was broken by someone else, basically. Um, so we understand the idea, but we thought it's a shame to kind of create uh, a uh, rupture uh, to to break this um, this filiation um, and and so the idea with the cute is uh, you have to rename them but more like uh, adding something lo like adding a suffix you have an example in the text it's like if you fork uh, Adelph uh, maybe to make it pointy you could rename it Adelph Silex and and we thought about but but what if some people the do a fork of a fork of a fork and it's going to be a very long name and for like, whatever like uh, it's kind of uh, you know when you have uh, Portuguese friends and they have a very long last name well uh, it <laughs> if it's okay for people to have very long last name well why not uh, font uh, <laughs> and it's kind of uh, also a nice way of seeing the history of uh, what happened So yeah, also invitation to reshare modification. Uh, so there is a, a thing here that if, if uh, someone like, for example, make uh, Vietnamese diacritics to the font, it can be added to the first version and the first version of the font can be uh, shared as the, as the previous one, but the person who did that uh, is added to the contributors and uh, yeah um, which is each modification new designer are added to the list um, and uh, yeah since the the file are complete and uh, well archived so the history is kept and uh, the date and context and all the history of the font It was uh, actually uh, quite long discussions about this uh, idea of uh, how do you do you take care of that of the history of working because typography is also a history of uh, copying always like uh, there is no the notion of uh, copyright is uh, very blurry in in type design because uh, it's always you're always making uh, new letters from something that uh, existed and uh, it's always it's kind of always forking in a way even before computer existed it was forks uh, uh, of uh, of fonts um, even if the language uh, wasn't the same for it um, so we thought about uh, adding uh, also a font log to but that's a uh, the thing is, you can put a lot of information into a font file in the font uh, info parameters, but they are not uh, easily accessible to users. So that's why uh, the, the font name is actually really important because it's one of the only things that uh, we are sure that all users will uh, will see. Um, 
Um, and that's why also we said that for redistribution, you have to keep all the package, keep all the files. And we, because we know that uh, maybe uh, it's, it's hard to control that, but uh, we had to write it down so that maybe it's done a bit, uh, a bit more <laughs> because yeah, the, the history is uh, often lost. So um, there is a big uh, point also on donation because uh, it's important to us to uh, make open the discussion about that and uh, we inspired ourselves of the green bottle sliding scale uh, which was a very useful tool to uh, write some condition uh, some like a scale when you can see uh, yourself when you are using a, a bye bye binary font uh, or a post binary font and we encourage uh, the designer and um, institution to uh, take this in account um, it's also um, making a difference be between free and uh, and free and gratis <laughs> Gratuit. Um, because uh, it's very uh, important to see uh, who is uh, publishing a font and uh, what's the, the, the context of use of the font. Uh, so yeah, um, in a precarious situation, um, we, we saw that a lot with the Bye Bye Binary, like most a lot of students and a lot of people that are um, uh, yeah, activists and um, political uh, contexts uh, use uh, our fonts. So yeah, in this case, uh, you, it's a pay what you can and if you can uh, system because it's, it's not like, um, uh, it don't have to be, uh, a problem if you can't afford fonts, but if you are using in a context that's uh, for a fight or something like that. And uh, the second one is linked to this one in support of the fight and the research. And it's like, if you can uh, um, pay a bit and contribute to uh, the effort of making fonts for that context, you can give from 10 to 50 euros. In a commission situation, in the context of a graphic designer working for uh, um, an institution or association organization, um, there are several price uh, linked to the size and the activity of the uh, entity. Uh, so 50 to 150 for an association, cultural org organization are more like diverse and uh, from very small uh, organization to more, uh, to bigger uh, institution. So yeah, 50 to 500. Uh, local commercial entreprise uh, is the same. And a cultural institution uh, that we know can be uh, big and have a lot of money is like more uh, 300 to uh, a thousand and a large company you can go elsewhere we are not interested uh, in see uh, what you are doing with our funds um yes yeah, so why did we write this scale um well first because um, we didn't have uh, something uh, that's clear about we had a donation system but uh, we didn't uh, really put uh, precise uh, prices uh, on it so a lot of people just didn't know how much it was uh, okay to give uh, when you're using a font and it's uh, really dependent on uh, the budget you have on the audience you you have um, and uh, we we started to to make this, and also we had uh, um, this kind of uh, weird things happening where uh, students would uh, maybe give us uh, fifty euros for using a font uh, inside their uh, thesis, for example, but. Uh, 
very big, very big <laughs> cultural institution uh, used one of our fonts uh, in uh, like uh, extremely like the letters was uh, maybe bigger than this one <laughs> and uh, and they didn't give us a cent when we know that the, for the communication of um, of this event uh, they had a, a big budget and since we are graphic designers we also used to well, i mean cultural institutions often are our clients so we know their budgets <laughs> and uh, yeah sometimes it's uh, it's not um, that uh, people are not well intentioned sometimes it's just that uh, the communication uh, is not uh, is not working the graphic designer is using the font and thinking uh, because it was easily downloadable downloadable in our website uh, they didn't see that uh, there were a donation uh, um, system and they just used the font for the project and didn't talk about that with their clients because they didn't uh, even know. So yeah, a bit, uh, a lot of uh, mis uh, miscommunication. So the Qt aims to kind of repair that and to propose this way of uh, paying gradually depending on uh, people's positions of uh, power and financial power more precisely. That's the idea. And as for forbidding large companies to use our fonts, um, it's just that we uh, we were kind of scared of because we at one point we started getting um, more and more publicity, and I mean we're not uh, extremely famous, uh, not yet actually, <laughs> but but, uh, but yeah, with the commissions of some cultural institutions, we thought that uh, for now we can kind of curate who we work with but um, uh, the, the fonts are kind of uh, out in the open on the web so we were, were kind of scared of uh, also them being used for pink washing um, and uh, I mean that's some, not something we can uh, uh, unless we hired a lot of lawyers we cannot really police uh, these uh, these uses but at least now we have a text that is quite uh, clear about it and we kind of made uh, yeah made our position clear and uh, what uh, other people will do with that is uh, their business um, and so yeah uh, we don't have really time to to show it to you but uh, there's a 2.0 version of the typotech that's uh, uh, being de developed uh, as I speak and it's going to be out uh, next month so stay tuned <laughs> <laughs>